his plaques. Um, Don't hate on his plaques. That's right. That's right. Period. Period. Yeah, let him understand. Recognize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay, very proud of all of them, I must say. I have 70 something wow. hanging in the walls of my house. Um, oh, yeah. That's why. That's yeah, you guys recording? Because I definitely yes, we are. We are recording. I've always said to people in interviews that I'm a very lucky and blessed man to have worked with so many talented artists from all over the world, artists, producers, engineers, and um, I'm proud of every one of those awards back there, you know? Welcome to Not Another White Man's Podcast, where you talk about random AOF topics uh, regarding the intersectionalities of race, gender, and everything in between. Um, I am joined here today by my two co-hosts, um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandy Blacker Anderson, and I am a lawyer, educator, and CEO and founder of the Anti-Racism Academy. Hi, all. My name is Hala. I'm a business and community development director in my town, and I'm an attorney and so happy to be here today. And my name is Kendra Dossi. I am an entertainer based in Massachusetts. And today we have a very special guest with us. So he is a pioneer in the mastering engineering industry. Um, he is very well known. He has worked with such heavy hitters such as uh, DMX, Whitney Houston, Jay-Z. Um, if you've heard them, you've probably heard this person's uh, skill on them. Also, we share the last same name because he's my dad. Uh, please welcome Tony Dossie. <laughs> Hi, <everybody. Yay>! Hi. <laughs> How's it going? So it's a uh, it's good. Yeah. Thank you for being here with us today, Dad. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope I <laughs> hope yeah, so uh, when when I first told my father that we wanted to interview him for a podcast, he thought it was just going to be about comedy, and I was like, "No, we're going to ask you about your career." Um, so, so yeah, are you are you ready to be asked about your career? <laughs> yes, I am. Let's get it popping. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from, and then a little bit about your journey to um, your career in audio mastering? Well, I grew up in New York, Spanish Harlem. Um, I was very lucky and fortunate enough to get a scholarship through the Boys Club of New York to go away to a prep school in Maine, where mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be a fashion or advertising photographer. But lo and behold, God and the universe has a, another way of leading you in a different direction. And after a year at Newport, SUNY Newport in New York, I got a job at a mastering facility named MasterDisc, where I was a, a shipping clerk, messenger. I did that type of thing. Um, it was a leg of the music business that I wasn't familiar with, I didn't even know it existed. Everybody knows you record music, 24 tracks, 48 tracks, whatever. From there, it goes to a mixing facility or sometimes the same place where they make it into a left and right channel or two track. After that, it goes to the third stage, which is called mastering. And basically with mastering, I've often said that we put the icing on the cake. We take what somebody's created in the recording and mixing process and we enhance it. We enhance it for CD, vinyl, or these days it's download streaming. So um, a long time ago, I just realized, I've always had a love for music growing up and you know, it was, we, we played basketball, we listened to music, we chased girls, we listened to music. Music was just a very important part of my life. So. Uh, I saw it as an advantage that perhaps I learned how to get into this mastering field, which of course, very little if any minorities were involved in. So uh, I've often said that I'm a very lucky and blessed man to have worked with so many talented artists, engineers, and producers from all over the world. So um, I started there in 1980 and uh, they started showing me how to do things in regards to mastering. And it was a little in intimidating at first because you have a large console with a whole bunch of knobs and all. And I, of course, didn't know what it, what it was or what it meant. But as time went on, I learned, I learned. And then um, I started mastering music shortly thereafter. Uh, we used to do a lot of people... Uh, with, with my start, I did a lot of people that used to just come off the street and just wanted their music mastered and all. So that's how I started. And that's how I perfected the skill of mastering. 
And then by 1987, I had my first big record, a big hit, uh, a musical soundtrack called La Bamba. Y'all might have known that. It was a huge record. It was uh, number one, sold four million copies. It was nominated for Grammys. And from there, you know, it, it took off. Wow. That's amazing. So you literally went from the the mailroom, working in the mailroom to being able to master Grammy award winning tracks. Can you talk a little bit more about like that specific process? So was it a formal process where folks are training you in that? Or did it just, you know, you just kind of picked it up or somebody there just, you know, looked out for you one day? Like what, what was that experience like? Well, we had at the time like three different mastering rooms and we had um, a whole lot of different engineers. Uh, the senior master engineer at the time was a guy named Bob Ludwig, who to this day is still regarded as one of the greatest master engineers ever. And um, so I learned a bit from him. I learned a bit from the others. And um, as time went on, uh, I started doing more and more work, but definitely um, Bob taught me a whole lot. I give him a lot of credit for, for what I've done in my career. Taught about professionalism, the client's always right. And just, you know, you learn by doing these records I talked about how to make a record sound good. And music has always been a big part of my life. So I knew what sounded right, so to speak. And it's just a matter of learning how to get the best out of the equipment. So did you then forget about photography entirely and fashion? Yeah, unfortunately, um, like I said, um, the universe and God has a way of steering you otherwise. And that's what I thought I wanted to do, but I thought mastering was really more exciting. And so, yes, I did put the camera down and got full-fledged into mastering, which was very- I borrowed uh, my dad's old camera for a college photography class and nice. then I broke it. <laughs> you, broke it. you never told me you broke it. No, I thought I did. I thought I, the button like popped out or something. You were, abu you were abusing my camera. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I think we got a new one. I think we just got a new one of the same type. I don't, I don't, I've, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, well, cool. it's okay. You you weren't using it. <laughs> no, it's true. Photography was my like early beginnings, and you know we, we put it away. So that's something from my past. I still have quite a few pictures and all I have from that, but it's a memory. Nice. So wait. So why why do you need? Why does one need to get their record mastered? Why why isn't it just good enough to you know, just record it and then just put it out in the world? Like a lot of people ask that question, and with today the music business changes so much where when I worked in it throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, it was very profitable. If you loved an artist, you went and brought their music. It's that simple. Whether it's vinyl, cassette, or CD. Nowadays, people download stuff for basically free or nothing. So in that sense, it's changed. But in answering your question, uh, mastering is an enhancement stage. So you're right. A lot of times people say coming out of the recording and mixing, why isn't it good enough right then? And the mastering is just, is just an edge. It gives a little bit of edge. I've often referred to it as the icing on the cake. Now, if you've ever had a piece of good cake, it's fine, it tastes great, but you put some icing on it and it takes it that much better. And that's what mastering is. It's just an enhancement of what you created. So is it a matter of like changing volume? I, I, this is just my own curiosity. <laughs> so we can ask other questions after this, but is it a matter of like making sure that the levels like are like, to get like, I don't know, cohesive or I don't need, I wouldn't even know how to describe or like the dynamics make sense together. Like yes. I, from track to track, you're right. It's our job when we're working on the album to try to get all the tracks at the a, at a, at a same level in terms of value. Um, in terms of bass, high and all that, it's, it's enhancement. I just, yeah. depending on, uh, you, you have to have a good relationship with your speakers in your room. And what you do is, uh, based on your experience, you enhance it. I may add two dB of bass on some tracks. I may add four on another. I may mm. sweeten up the top end, sweeten up the mid range. We basically do whatever is necessary to get it sounding better. That's so cool. That really, I would think that could potentially have a lot of effect on the feel of oh, a song. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely right. does. Definitely does. Yeah. Do you it's work with the artist when you do it or you do your take and then you send it back? Like, how does that, is it like collaborative effort? Oh, or definitely how? back in the day in New York where, you know, I had a, a studio, I worked at Masterdice in Manhattan. Uh, normally people would come in, whether it was the artist, people from the record label, the producer, or even an engineer. Normally you did work with people and, you know, just to oversee it, make things, sure things go in the right direction, so to speak. But nowadays, 
that's very rare. I'm down in Atlanta, Georgia now, and uh, everything is over the internet. People send you their music. They, they depend on you to do what you do, and you send it back to them after receiving payment. Mm. So it's changed a lot in that regard. But back in the day, always had people coming in, record label, engineers, producers, all of that. Do you feel like it changed your process? Um, and I ask, my, my only frame of reference is I was working on doing like music for a, like a little mini documentary I made. And I realized like, it's a kind of like a spiritual experience or is it like that for you? Like just sitting with it and listening to it or how much of it is like your experience of the artist? Like, it, or is it just, does it all just come from like your like feeling? It's a, that makes bit, sense. it's a little bit of everything that you said. I mean, definitely your experience pays a large part in how the final result is. But, but I've always had a love for music. So growing up, like I said, we played music all the time. And um, so that helped out a lot. But then um, you definitely get into it. I'm a, I'm a big music fan before I got into the mastering and all, and even now to this day. Um, so that that all helps. All that helps in achieving, you know, it sounding a whole lot better than what it is. When it came to you. Gotcha. You said that you played music a little bit in like high school, right? I played music ever since I was a kid. Uh, my mom at night worked at a, a hospital. So she would leave the radio on kind of like security when she went. So music was always played. And then growing up as a teenager, I had a little job at a newspaper route. And me and the group of guys in the neighborhood used to go down and buy vinyl records like at least a couple of times a month. Um, vinyl was very cheap back then. It was only $3.99. I still have quite a bit of it in the house to this day, but we constantly went and brought music all the time. We, um, like I said, played basketball music was playing. We chased girls music was playing. So it's always, always been around. It's always been a big part of my life. Who were some of the girls that you, you chased when you were, uh, what? <laughs> you, you, you wouldn't know them. That's the question. <laughs> you wouldn't know them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't know any of them. Uh, no, you wouldn't. Not even what? my mother. I wouldn't know any. What are your favorite? What were your? What were your? What were your favorite music? What was your favorite music to listen to growing up? Like, what were your like, musical influences coming up? Were you a Motown guy? Like, what? What was your era? Oh, definitely it was it was R and B to dance music. I would say, um, and it was so much music growing up, a lot more than what it is today. I remember the stylistics, the moments, the shy lights, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Hamilton, Bohan, and James Brown. I can name names for days, but it was just a lot of great music growing up in the seventies, eighties, nineties, and all. And uh, very rarely did you disappoint. We used to buy our albums, and very rarely was it a bad album, you know. Now, so that, that brings us to my next question, um, and it's a two-sided question. So maybe let, let's, let's start with the bad, because I'm, I'm messy. Have you ever worked on an album that you listened to and you were like, uh, this, this is trash? <laughs> um, and you don't have to name names. I mean, like, you know, perhaps if the album didn't do well, then we can name names. But if it did, then we, we can, you can just gloss over it. But have you ever had that experience? Um. In the beginning stages, uh, there was a point where I was doing a lot of heavy metal and stuff like mm. that. And that's not quite what I grew up listening to. So it was a little bit different for me. Um, again, I had to be professional about it and just try to make it sound as best wow. I could. But that was a little strange. But then it, it changed over. I was doing a lot of jazz. Mm. I, I, I grew to love jazz working there. Master this again because Bob Ledwood used to do people like Spyro Gyro and Earl Clue. Chuck Mangione, and so, and then, um, you know, when hip hop came about, uh, that first Criss Cross record I did, and that just, that just took off and changed. Wait, me. which Criss, which Criss Cross record? The very first one they had out, um, with the, little remember Jump, Jump, when they used yeah. to get the clothes back yeah. with all of that. Wait, <laughs> so the, the first hip hop record you worked on was Jump by Criss Cross? That was the first big one for sure. Wow, wow. Yeah. And that. That's some people to this day say that that changed my career and led me to be where I am now. And I, I don't want to think it's just that. I think it was a whole group of them, but that was a very, very big record that year. And that, that's it. Your name being on records is like a great advertising tool and it leads to other work. People see your name on there and they go, oh, I want to work with that guy that did that record because it sounded so good and it sold a lot. So let's let's get into some of these records. Um... So first I want to ask, like, what, what has your favorite um, record been? It doesn't have to be hip hop, but just any of the records you've worked on. And then we can start to go through some, this, this catalog is crazy, but go ahead. It's a long catalog, yeah. Um, it's a lot. 
Do I have a favorite? It's funny you ask that. Um, again, I'm very blessed to have worked with so many talented artists and so forth, but the favorite record I think I have, which I still play a lot to this day, is a, a jazz record <laughs> by the name of Urban Nights. Mm. It featured a whole lot of talented people like Grover Washington Jr. and just a whole lot. And if I'm driving somewhere long, that CD is in my car. And mm. to this day, I just, it's just a, a great sounding record. And I had so much fun doing it and all that, you know, so that one sticks out a little bit, but then there, there are a few others too that, uh, uh, to this day, um, master engineers don't get royalties. Unfortunately, if I did, I'd be super rich. But, I was going to ask, um, like, wait a minute now, what are points well, at? <laughs> I've, been, I've been told that I deserve it, but that's about as far as it go. No, we would, we would represent another hand of cookie jar. And you know the record label, they probably wouldn't want to have any of that. But uh, I thought you used to get points. Was was there a time where you did? I think that was a dream I might have had. I guess. You. <laughs> I guess I was wrong. I was wrong. The biggest selling record I worked on was a uh, Kid Rock's "Devil Without a Cause." Um, last I know, it sold 11 million copies in the United States. Wow! And if it sold that many, then about half more would be sold internationally. And to this day, um, I wish I had royalty points on that. Ooh, Lord, 11 million sold. And I guess I just, I don't have a good grasp on music because I feel like, I, I mean, I, I vaguely, I mean, I know of Kid Rock, but then I read like the list of some of these other songs you worked on. Like in my mind, like Party Up is a bigger song <laughs> than yeah. that. I mean, <laughs> like, Kid Rock is very much a uh, uh, Caucasian uh, I'm like, I'm no <laughs> genre. yeah um i mean there was there was also like whitney houston right there was like yeah Kim braxton mm -hmm. i'm just trying to like dmx was a big one um to me i'm trying to think of like other things yeah wait a minute so i'm going to the site okay. so that we can go to the grammys tab because yes. our guest has a grammys tab Okay, <laughs> like understand that we are sitting with a legend in the game. Sorry, now my my uh Wi-Fi is acting up. It doesn't want to load this web page. Well, maybe, I, maybe like I, I, constantly, I constantly admit that I'm a very lucky and blessed man, and uh, you don't have to be humble. Well, that's you just can... me. I just that's just me. That's just like. <laughs> No, you you should gas yourself up. You gotta brag out sometimes. Yeah, you gotta brag. No, that's just, just a little bit. Nature. That's not my nature, bit. really. Didn't you work like, on the Anastasia soundtrack? That that movie in like the mid '90s. Here we go. Oh yeah, that uh, big soundtrack I did, of course, with the La Bamba, but also Doctor Doolittle. And oh yeah, you were Doctor Doolittle. Yeah, yeah. yeah that. And there was an Aaliyah song on that, right? Oh yeah, that was a big one, one in a million. Okay. Yes. Wait, see, see, what? Wow. Hold on. You like you've like such a long career over so many different genres. Did you see any changes from like the beginning as you were starting towards like, you know, all like as the years went on in the field of mastering and what you were doing? Uh mastering wise, um technically, yes, things did change. Back in the day, I had a big analog console, um, which was just different devices that you use to enhance the sound. Nowadays, it's a lot of computer-based, or you, or you have a choice, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the old analog console is very, very expensive to buy these devices and to maintain it. Whereas nowadays, we use plugins, and they're more affordable. There's lots and lots and lots of them. So yeah, it's definitely changed from back in the 80s, 90s versus now. That kind of reminds me of some of the... Um the complaints or the criticism I hear from people who do like or people who do DJing on traditional turntables and like that whole process of folks having to learn how to like um like mix and engineer music I guess old-fashioned way and a lot of people are like you know these young kids they don't know about digging in the crates they don't know like how to work uh, you know turntables and all of this and so I wonder do you think it's a, a good thing that, um, you know, music has in a lot of ways become more democratized, so like more people have access, or do you think the music has suffered as a result of more people being able to put themselves out there as either, you know, a producer or do what you do, or uh, even just be an artist for that matter? I think there's pluses and minuses to current year 2021. Um, now with the internet, 
an artist can get on, make themselves a great website and be known to the world. Back in the day, you depended on the record company to do that. Um, they were the best in terms of marketing and getting you new out there, but now you could do it on your own. And um, it wasn't cheap too. Don't think that uh, uh, someone who had a record label contract, by the time they finished with you, you could have sold a million records, but by the time they slashed for advertising, this, that, and that, and that, you didn't get as much money as you thought. But so in some ways it's a gift and a curse. It does allow more people to sit at home and be creative without the tremendous expense of studio time and all of that and to be able to market yourself and get it out to the masses, you know? Um, yeah, no, I, I think in a lot of ways it's better for artists, but then I do wonder um, to what extent music is more limited. I think to tie it to like larger structural issues, I know in like during the Reagan administration, there were a lot of major slashes to music, edu music education programs. So whereas a lot of kids, particularly black and brown kids were able to learn how to play instruments and, you know, so much of like black music culture was built off of live instrumentation that, um, you know, since those programs have gone away, there are less people who, you know, can read music perhaps and, you know, are playing instruments in studios. And so some people say like, you know, the music is suffering as a result because people don't have that same music. How even, even, when, even when it comes to like vocalists, like they're not coming out of the church anymore or out of like, you know, your traditional like yeah. school choruses and things like that. And a lot of people use auto-tune and yeah. yeah. So it's like. Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely changed a lot. I mean, growing up and all, everybody had a, a big band and it was instruments. You had horn players in addition to drums and guitars and all of that. And nowadays that's not necessarily true. You can yeah. sample something, you can uh, borrow something somewhere and also it's changed in that regard. And I feel bad for the studio musicians because uh, they're not hired as much as they used to be back in the day. Because now yeah. you could replace that guitar player with something uh, from a, a sample off a computer or something. So yeah. it's unfortunate, you know, I know a lot of people have suffered because of it, but. It also allows you to be creative in your home. You could be in your 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 computer at home in your underwear and be creative and do your thing without the big cost of a studio. So it's gifts and curses, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so wait, did you so you said your favorite, you said your favorite artist that or the favorite song you've worked on or record you worked on rather, and you said the music you grew up with listening to, but what who is your favorite artist to listen to? Like what is your ideal? Um I'm, music I'm, I'm not going to say I have a favorite. It really depends on my mood. Um, sometimes He's being I, polite. No, it's true. Sometimes I'm in a smooth way. I want to hear some jazz. Sometimes I may want to be a little edgy and I want to hear some DMX or something, you know. I will say that when Kendra was born, I had to be careful with the type of music I played in. Mm. You know, I didn't, I Why? Didn't really play. I didn't want to play a whole lot of stuff with curses and you know lyrics of bitches and niggas and all that stuff. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give you perhaps the wrong impression. So <laughs> I would then, not play that in the house, and, you know. But uh, and and look at me now. Well, <laughs> Great. Maybe, maybe you're a little bit more cleaner now because of it. You know. I, I don't know if that's true. Um, I definitely okay. never want to want you to have the impression that you were a, you know a bitch or a hoe or any of that stuff, which is. <laughs> Ramping in a lot of lyrics, <laughs> to be and then Kendra's like, "I am both." <laughs> <laughs> I know that kills me. Like, I, I, as a parent, like that's so upsetting to me. The lyrics that are in today's music, I just—it's always been around. I think music and artists are always like um, are on the edge of culture and always pushing the boundaries. Like that's what creativity is about. But. Um, but it, like, it's really hard. Like the music that my kids listen to, I'm like, I don't want you listening to this. I'm just so upset that it's out there. But yeah. And the strange thing is, is um, back yeah. growing up as a teenager, or there was no such a thing as a clean version. There was no dirty right. lyrics with music, no such yeah. a thing. That didn't come till later on, in particularly yeah. with the hip hop feel and all, you know, in the eighties and all that, where they had to make a clean version and take the curses out in those drug references and just the foul yeah. language. So thanks Tipper I mean, Gore. Oh. Definitely when uh, Kendra well, came in 92, I had to- Dolores A. Tucker. <laughs> hey, listen, listen, oh, what Uncle Luke and the two live crew did for First Amendment rights, uh, <laughs> all Americans should be, should be thankful. 
<laughs> remember that album cover? They uh, banded that in record stores and all because you know it it, it showed uh, what was it four or five women there in bathing suits, but all out and everything else. And he said Uncle Luke said that he's the one who actually designed that advisory uh, label that that has to go on all of the like explicit. Yeah. Um, parental and then someone advisory. for the parental advisory, and yeah. someone asked him like, Do, "Are you getting paid off of that?" He's like, "No, actually." And I'm like, yeah. "That's you should have trade, sucks. You should have trademarked it, really." I Period. Guess it's, 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 exactly. Yeah, you should have, though. Hmm. But, you know, it's just a part of life in our culture. You got to be aware of that. Like I said, and I mean, music's one thing, but also some of these video games they got now, where it's so graphic, how they shoot up and kill people. So it's, really a, it's really a different era that we live in these days for sure you know yeah no it's it's true i wonder like is there like is there any way to put the cat back or what is it the yeah cat, it? the like any way to kind of contain yes yeah that. i'm like is it a rabbit or a cat okay and there's a cat out the bag rabbit in the hat all right got it got it yeah rabbit in the, hat. Well, the, I mean, the matter is like in terms of those video games so much money is made i don't agree with that i've seen people playing videos where you slash a person in half and the guts come all out and Absolutely. you know um, they don't ever want to talk about that even with the guns where you go in and shoot up people and everything else that contributes to some of what's going on in our society but because so much money is made you know corporate america is not going to put that on the ground too much well listen this is a perfect segue into uh my little conspiracy theories theories um segment <laughs> so all right i i saw recently saw a um a youtube video featuring crazy bone from bone thugs and harmony and in this video he talks about being invited to a meeting like a secret meeting at some like record executive's house along with some other artists and other like industry people and he basically um articulates that he, these record industry people propositioned him and some and several other artists um with a deal to get in exchange for making and creating like um violent music music that like promotes selling drugs and you know everything that really cat characterized rap music like gangster rap era um that in exchange for doing that they would be given um like stock in the cca the the private prison industry like the public company that owns all the private um pri prisons and so he 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 like i don't know and there's there's like several interviews of him talking about this on um youtube but from from this conversation i i asked my husband like you know who do you do you like, one do you do you believe that this could be true that like there could be like an intentional um or there was an intentional effort on the labels to like get artists to, to like you know create more of this music that could potentially help them keep prisons populated that that's the whole argument like you know the more we push this one narrative you know the more we can like you know increase our chances of like keeping the prisons full so we can keep making money off of people so one do you believe that this is like the case and if if so like who do you think sign like do because <laughs> Do you think everybody signed or was it just some people? What are your thoughts? I wonder if Kanye did. Well, because Kanye, he doesn't really, he probably did sign exactly. something. So he doesn't, he, he signed something. Yeah. He signed something. He definitely signed something. Maybe not that deal, but he definitely signed something. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing I think you've got to realize is uh, America is about them dollars. I mean, look at our healthcare system versus other, other countries and in America, money talks, bull walks. And back in the day, if you had a million selling album, that generated between eight and $10 million that got passed around. That's just off 1 million. So yes, if you had a multi-selling album, a lot of money was passed out. It's that simple. So um, in keeping that thought, I wouldn't be surprised if some of that was true, perhaps in the era of gangster rap and all where they promoted a lot of violence and everything else. I wouldn't kind of be surprised, you know, especially when they saw that that type of music sold, you know, sold a lot of copies too, you know. So I, I really wouldn't be surprised, but I can't say I've heard of that personally myself. Mm. That's enough for me. 
So we got a music <laughs> insider here saying he don't put it past them. I don't either. <laughs> period. On money, this spot, yeah, go ahead. You know, I was gonna say this money talks in America. Let's call it what it is. I know Kendra as a young person used to say, why is healthcare free in Canada, where it's, it's so expensive here in America? That sounds like me. <laughs> Great yeah, question. I remember that. I always remember you saying that once when we went up to Canada on vacation, how you you were attracted to Canada because of that. And um, yeah, it's it's about money here. I'm sorry to say that. It's about the dollars here. Well, yeah. that, and we also have a long history of making money off of the backs of black people like the physical labor like so prison labor is still slave labor and you know right. so there's a and then yeah so i'll put it past me either. yeah down here in georgia every once in a while i'll be out driving around and you'll see the state prison truck on the side of the highway and you uh, see them picking up garbage so yeah that that stuff definitely still does exist unfortunately yeah. did you did you ever feel as a black man in the industry that um you had difficulty breaking in or getting assignments or anything like that? Um, well, I'll be honest in saying that I saw it as an advantage to me because um, there were very, very few, if any, Black master engineers. Um, there's a gentleman named Herb Powers who was the first Black person I saw in a mastering studio. And it kind of motivated me. I was like, wow, we could do this? But aside from that, um, not the two dot horns, but we were the two biggest black engineers in the in the in the probably even still to this day. Um, there's a lot more engineers recording and mixing, but mastering there was only two of us. So um, it was. It, I'm not going to say it's a, you know, the doors are totally closed to us. That's not fair. I'm very thankful that the people that mastered this um, allowed me to grow into being what I I was, but. Um, I'm sure it exists. I mean, like I said, there's very, very few of us that are doing mastering to these days. It's normally a white man doing it, whether it's it, music or anything else. Yeah. That's the way it is. But I took it as an advantage. I was like, I'm sure in some ways our people would like to work with their own type. That's what I was yeah. going to ask you. Yeah, that's also yeah. why I was going to ask, because it seems like, um, I don't know about this other like mastering engineer. His name is like Herbie. Herb Powers. Yep. Herb Howard. Yeah, um, he, was big, he was a big guy. He still is. But he did yeah. stuff like Alicia Keys. He did the, okay. the Destiny's Child. He was a big guy. Yeah, because I was about to say, like, a lot of people in your, it's not, like, exclusively Black, but there are a lot of Black people that you've mastered. Like, do you, and it seems like other people that used to work at MasterDisc, like, they were the ones that were like, okay, like, here's Nirvana, or like, here's, you know, like, Alien F or whoever, and then they gave you, like, DMX, even though you have, you've mastered, like, Nine Inch Nails and, like, other people. So do you, do you feel like, white artists have like shied away from having you as their mastering engineer because of like you are associated with um hip-hop music or um, jazz or other like black genres of music i'm not gonna say they shied away from that because i've, I've worked with quite a few white artists too over the years uh it basically comes down to people feeling you're the best person to get their their stuff done that's what it comes down to um I say a large percentage of, of the people I work with are black, of course, but there's been a, a quite a few others too. Like I said, the biggest record I've done, Kid Rock, he's a white American, you know? Yeah, and a trash one at that. Um, <laughs> hey, be nice. You don't, <laughs> yes. I, it's not, you're not saying it, I'm saying it, I could say it. You've also, you've also done Moby, who's also a white right, man. Right, and who that, did that, not... that, record, that record was huge. It was 18 yeah. tracks on this album, and it's the only album in history where every track was either used for a, a, a commercial or a soundtrack. Wow, wow. Remember, that is really uh, impressive. Yeah, I, I, it, was, it was crazy. I remember watching TV and it, all of a sudden the Moby track would come up with the commercial. Or I remember watching, um, uh, what's the guy, Russell Crowe in that, that, um, that movie with the gladiators. And at the end of that, it was a Moby track. I was like, oh my God, oh, oh. He, made, he made mega money off of that. I mean. It was yeah. it was a decent selling album. It did more worldwide, but he made so much money off of the licensing for movies and, and soundtracks and, and commercials. You know? yeah. so, and so, yet he still did not date Natalie listen, Portman. Listen, all I know is in Moby, you can get stomped by OB, you 36 year old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Eminem. Uh, and then I and then I remember he like had a memoir. Again, you don't need to talk about this with us dad i know that 
you know, he, he might ask you to master again, but I know that Moby had that like, uh, memoir he was like yeah like I like dated Natalie Portman and Natalie Portman was like no you didn't oh no <laughs> it was, and then he was like sorry you're right like it was really weird that's really weird that that's is weird how you claim to date weird. somebody and you really not that's a little that's, that's mad crazy it was yeah. it was a lot yeah um but, so but like wait so you said something that really blew my mind though and it and when you think about it like wow so the fact that most mass people who master music are white people, like everyone didn't get a chance to work with you or um, Herbie Howard. Herbie, so Herbie Powers, Herbie, Herbie Powers, or sorry, I'm Herbie Powers Jr. is his name. Herbie yeah. Powers Jr. Mm-hmm. So, like, I just wonder, like, how do you think being like not being of a culture impacts? like the the mastering process and I know you said you had the experience of having to like master like heavy metal music so like with the inverse like how do you and and I I ask that because like so much of media that's put forth as like either black media or media featuring people of color diverse media is made by white people or heavily influenced by white people and people don't realize that and, and it's like well how could you criticize it there's black faces but it's like but you could tell like it's white hands all over this like mm. it wasn't no like nobody put no season on them put no love on it so what <laughs> what is that like in the in the context of, of music mastering um i have openly said before in um interviews with like the Red Bull Academy that I really feel music crosses all genres and there's really no color with music. Think about it. Mm. Uh, doesn't matter what type it is. You got white people like in rap, all kinds of people like in jazz, people like R&B. So I really feel music, I really feel music is a universal language. I've said that before, you've heard it before, and it's really true. It's no color when it comes to purchasing and buying music. Now, in terms of working with engineers and all, I think you gotta, you should be picking who you feel can best do the job, whether it's to record it, to mix it, to master it, or to produce it. That's I would like to think that's what it should be. Um, why there isn't more of us doing this, I really can't answer that question. But I do you really need to like it? I guess you need to like a song in order to do your best job on it. Um, yeah. No, I think um, at some point you have just to be professional. You really have to. Um, like I said, back in the day when I was doing a bit of heavy mer- metal, I'm not familiar with heavy metal. That's not what I listened to growing up. So again, I just had to take it for what it's worth and just try to yeah. enhance it and make it sound better. Yeah. Now, now but what I, is better when like, <laughs> it's like this, to me, that sounds like noise. Like just some, yeah. ah, like, so like <laughs> yeah, like what would be better? Yeah. Like yeah, uh, what's considered better for heavy metal? Like, <laughs> Well, stronger bass like I, I don't like know. with everything else just make it better than what it came to you got you like got there's you. a button on the console where it says in that's the way it came to you and there's a button that says out and that's what it sounds like after you're finished with it so got you yeah you just want to enhance and make better that's all that's always gotcha. my approach no matter what type of music i don't have a certain sound i feel for heavy metal jazz r&b or hip-hop i don't i take what they give me and i want to make it better as simple as that do you listen to it in different space, like music in different places in order to get a sense of how it will sound like? Yes, I have some decent speakers in my studio, some Focal monitors. It was the first time I had to buy my own speakers. Um, when I worked in Masterdice, I had these Griffin monitors that cost like $15,000. Wow. Yeah, I'm, thank God I didn't have to pay for them. I have my own speakers here. They're in the neighborhood of $4,000, no big deal. But um. When I work on an album, I will. I'll, I'll master it in the studio. I have two different sets of speakers here, but a lot of times I'll take a drive with it. I'll make a CD of the project and I'll go for a drive and just listen to it on some some speakers that aren't so-called professional. Right. Said, yeah. Most people don't have speakers in their home that are 10,000, 5,000, no. whatever dollars. So I didn't realize I they sold those. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? There are speakers that cost $100,000. Um, like yeah, for a stadium sounds, like what the, yeah like for what? I, think, I think that's kind of ludicrous to spend that much money on some speakers because in the end speakers are speakers right they reproduce sound so ha, so have you so i know you said that it's more rare these days to actually meet artists in person um but like have you ever met like, or i should say like who or were some of the, what were some of the coolest experiences you've had either like meeting artists in the studio or just generally being in the industry 
Uh, I met the artist named Prince. May he rest in peace. But he came in, and I was like, wow. And I said to him, I said, one of the biggest joys I have in this business is uh, loving someone as an artist, and then you get to meet them. And so meeting him was really, really special and all. It, it really was. Uh, How short was he? he, he <laughs> was he wearing very, heels? He had on some heels. He yes. had a lot of heels on. He yeah. had a whole makeup that all three of y'all together, the truth <laughs> is. But uh, yeah, he had on some heels. He's very short, very little, frail like man. But it was such a pleasure meeting him and working yeah. with him. Um, the biggest kick I got probably is working with people before they blow up. You know, yeah. um, I I got to work with Tyrese after his uh, Coca-Cola commercial. He had just signed to mm. RCA Records. Wow. And he flew in and we spent the day. And he was just so down to earth and cool. And was, you know, uh, sharing with me experiences with his mother and all that he was going through. And that, I love seeing the artists when that when they're rare. And all. even like Kid Rock. Kid Rock just sat on the side of the, of the studio and didn't say much of nothing. He's not like that now. I'm sure he's a lot more radical and everything else. Um, so yeah, working and meeting with, with people is, is just the best and all. And uh, I really wish I got to meet Whitney Houston. She stayed uh -huh. at the hotel. I was so disappointed. Mm. And, um, I've never gotten into people's business about what's going on. But at the end of the night, I would have put my arms around Whitney and I just would have said, we love you. That's all. Yes. Yeah. Like that. And uh, I was disappointed by chance. Yeah. Yeah. R.I.P. Whitney. Um, have you ever worked with an artist that like their album ended up getting shelved after like all of your like hard work it never came out? I'm sure I have. Um, I'm sure I have. Uh, I can't say I necessarily can name them, but um, you forgot them too. You're like I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, because you know most of the records I I've done are uh, like Grammy know. award winning records. Yes, we know. <laughs> A lot of them, you know, the record company had a plan. You know, they had a plan, a marketing plan. And um, I'm glad to say quite a few of them sold millions and millions of copies, you know, which again, generated a lot of money for the for the record labels. Something people don't realize, even like with DMX, his first five albums that I got to master sold over 50 million copies. That's something that Jay-Z can't say, something Nas can't say, Snoop Dogg. None of them guys could say that their first five albums sold that many copies. So I'm very glad that I'm currently working on his newest one. Very Word? Excited. Oh yeah, I have been working on that. Wow. Could we, could we say, could we like publish that part of- Yeah, the, is it like, uh, like a yeah, secret? I'm not playing any music, but no, everybody knows. He's, he talked okay. about it before his death. Yo! <laughs> he was working on his record and all, and um, I thought it was finished, unfortunately, but Swiss Beats decided to take a few songs off and add a few more. Uh, but, so, like, uh, do you know Swiss Beats? Uh, there's a picture of me on the website. He's there. <laughs> He's 17-year-old when we did the wow. first Wow. But do you, like, know him? Like, does I'm he call you and he's like, listen, Alicia is, like, doing this <laughs> and that and... No, unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I'm not his best friend in that regards, you know. Okay. But you do, but you, but you've been around him and that, like, you, you guys are familiar with each other. I think, I think he remembers who I am, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I, right. I helped, I helped put some money in his pocket. Absolutely. So, I, <laughs> I, I asked because I was watching this documentary. Um, I guess like BT put out a Rough Riders like mini series like in the last few years, and just like seeing like Swiss Beast being like this like young kid just like watching like his older cousins like putting stuff together, and him just like that's so crazy. So you got to meet him like right there, like right in I, like I had to when he was fresh, fresh wow. and new, seventeen years old, and I. I know I said something to him about keep doing your thing because that, that young to him to have done that first record was just, you know, come yeah. on. It, it was Wait, Rough Riders, Rough Riders Anthem or uh -huh. is it? Yeah, that, yeah. That became his highest charting <laughs> record. That that was a, that was big. I mean, that yes. whole, all of his albums, every one of his albums had a few big hits on it. Get at me, dog, you know, and so on. And stop being greedy and so forth. Oh, I, I love you know. DMX. So yeah. wait. So did you meet him and you, did you get to like spend time with him in the studio? Believe it or not, I was working with DMX before he was a star. I wow. was uh, friends with Joaquin Dean from the Rough Riders. Mm -hmm. And in the process of him being signed, they used to release records on him in the street. Unfortunately, they didn't do much because he was in and out of jail a lot. Right, and, uh, right. He finally got his first deal with Rough House Records, the same label that did Criss Cross. They um, gave him a one record deal. He put out Born Loser. Didn't really make that much noise. They let him go. 
the FGM mm -hmm. picked them up years later and after get at me dog the rest is history the rest is history yeah. so I did meet him um a few times last time I saw him uh in my studio at least I saw him perform in concert in New York but in my studio he came in with his his dog that literally scared the shit out of me wow he big ass pit bull <laughs> came in my room aggressive he like circled the room like he's ready to chew oh my god and I was just so nervous saying, please don't bite me. Please don't bite me. But he was there for a little while and then he disappeared. He left. Oh, wow. Well, rest in peace, DMX. Yeah. RIP DMX, RIP Prince, RIP yeah. Whitney. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so many, so many legends. You'd really ha have worked with so many legends. Yeah. Hey, I'm a very lucky and blessed man. You know, I've, I've said that throughout my life. I'm a very lucky and blessed man. And I got a question for you. You mentioned something about how the music industry, um, you would get records to master or music to master once the record companies have really worked it up. So um, you're kind of like the last step in that in that process. How is it today though? How does it work with people have the ability to do it uh, themselves on the computer? Like, are they coming to you? Are they like, how, how has that industry well, changed now? The veterans and, and, and a large percentage of people know that you still need to get your record mastered. But because music doesn't sell quite like it used to, um, a lot of artists are doing everything themselves. I know a lot of artists that are recording, mixing and mastering themselves or they may not master it at all because they just put it up on the, the downloading streams and, and let it go. So, you know, the computer has been a gift and a curse in the music business. It's allowed an unknown artist to go out and promote yourself and do your thing, but it's also hurt in a lot of ways too. Like back in the day, I used to build in the neighborhood of a million dollars. I'm nowhere near that anymore. Nowhere near that, you know, because a lot of people, they are doing it themselves. The labels aren't putting out as much music as they used to because the profit margin is not like it used to be. I'm from an yeah. where people brought music, you know, and yeah. I, I miss those days, to be honest with you. I really do. I miss those days. Mm. What would you say to someone who wanted to go into the business? I then? say um, just put in the time and perfect your craft. I'm part of a, a worldwide mastering engineer site on Facebook. And um, mm. a lot of people seem to have a little bit of attitude about the engineers that used to charge a lot of money or still do even. And um, I compared the same way like a high paid athlete. You may be paying a guy $20 million and you don't even make the playoffs. The truth of the matter is that's just the, the way it is, the, go, the sign of the times, the going rate or whatever. And um, mm -hmm. I used to, back in the day, master you should charge $450 an hour to work with me. I'm not getting that anymore. It just, it just did not you, wait, did you get all of those profits or for the 450? <laughs> No, I got a percentage of my monthly sales. Okay, all right. Of which, of which put us in a nice home and helped pay for your college. Did you ever consider going solo and doing it on your own? Or was it, you just had like a setup that you never even, like you were so well set up that you didn't even consider it? I did consider that in New York, but I was very afraid of the, of what it costs to have your own studio. I was very afraid of that. So I didn't do it in that sense. Um, one year, I think like 2001, I sat down because I was curious about how much I had billed over the years. I knew um, I had a nice paycheck. We lived in a nice home. I was saving for Kendra's college. I drove a nice car. So I sat down one year and just added it up from 1990s when I officially got my, my room where I'm a, I was a full-time master engineer. And I added it up and my mouth dropped. Um, my mouth dropped. It, it, it was millions and millions of dollars. Exactly. And, the truth of the matter is, had I gone out into my own, who's to say it would have been the same? Who's to say, you know? But I yeah. did think about it, but like I said, the rents in New York scared me always. So um, yeah. I didn't do that until uh, 2014 is when I finally went out on my own. You know, but by then it, it wasn't the same, of course. And now down here in Georgia, I have a home and I have a studio here. But the, the, the music business has changed so much. So much of it now is over the internet. Yeah. Very rarely do people come in my house, you know, very, very rare. My man, DJ Premier uh, from Gangstar fame, he's been in my house. You know, we worked on the latest Gangstar album. He flew in and came in my house, but it's very rare these days. Question. Did you, did you give him anything to drink? What did he, what did you offer him? 
Uh, we had, we had, after the end of the night, we drunk a little <laughs> bit and we, we, I fed him. I fed him, of course. He's a, he's a good friend of mine as well as a client and um, <laughs> should be working on the new Jill Scott real soon. I can't wait. For Ooh. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm a Philly girl. So right. I love, love, Philly love. From just Philly. Philly from Philly, right? Yeah, Absolutely. I look forward to that. And I wonder if she may pop up. That would be really nice. That would be really nice. Yeah. That would be nice. So question. So when people talk about owning their masters and all of that, like what what is so what is what you do in relation to these masters people talk about? Like, do you like have the physical thing and then you like pass it off or like well, what is a master? I don't know. What it what is is um what comes out of the recording and mixing studio is considered your master. It goes gotcha. to the master and engineer and then he enhances it. But for the most part, major labels tend to own the masters, which means they profit the most from that. When people do cover tunes, when it's used for a commercial, they get the money for that. If you own your own masters, like someone like Prince went on to do and a few others, then you're more in control of that. You get to license it to a commercial or a soundtrack, a movie or something if you want. So it's rare, but um, uh, in terms of with the record label, it's rare. Um, if you're on your own as a solo artist, then yes, you own your masters and you have more, reap more profits from that. But back right. in the day, the label always owned the rights to your masters and they profited the most from it. If you remember Prince, uh, he, he once said at the Grammys that he was a slave to the record labels for that reason and all. And he fought to get his masters, which he ended up getting later on in life before he passed. Mm -hmm. You know. absolutely do you think it's worth it for a young artist to fight for that for, for that kind of for fight to keep their masters i think a lot of times the question is sort of pit to him like all right well like either you take this check for a million dollars and you've never had a million dollars before and you sign away at whatever or you know you risk losing the deal altogether because they could find someone else who's just as talented as you are or is it like that like you know is talent kind of a, a dime, a dime? Like who, who, who's, who's really helping whom here? Is it a 50, 50 thing? Or is it like mainly the like black labor being exploited? What's up? Well, I think you definitely need to have yourself a good lawyer. That's number one, because uh, let's be honest, record labels have, Brandy. They, have <laughs> they have taken advantage of people over the years. Yeah. You think about TLC, you can, you can name Tony Braxton. Way, right, you can name artists from way them. back in the day where, they may have been the third link, you know, they were signed to like LaFace records, which were signed to such and such and all. So um, um, a lot of times these days, they have these other deals where the label will sign you. They may even advance you some money. But when you go on tour, if you sell a T-shirt, they got their hand in the cookie jar. And that's what a lot of people do that just to be down, so to speak. I don't, I don't necessarily feel it's your best interest. If you remember recently, Megan Thee Stallion went through the, the, the whole thing with her label for the same reason. She felt she wasn't getting paid accordingly. So it's something that's been happening for a long time and it's still happening. So you need to have good representation. You need to have lawyers look at the contracts and try to do what's best for you. Now, a lot of times just to be down, people will go ahead and take that deal because that's what's offered to them. So yeah. you got to do what's best for you, I think, in the long run. But if you can control and own your masters, then good for you. That's the best. You know, you'll be more in control of the money and everything that it generates. I think it's so true, but it's hard for people when you're starting out, like as to what Brandy said, that, oh, here's this money that you've never seen before. Take it, you know, here's your million. And if you don't, I'm not going to give you any. I think it's it's very hard oh, yeah, to say, yeah. I want, you know, I want to have these rights, these future rights to believe in yourself enough and to also just have the guts to kind of have that backbone. So yeah, I look, I think lawyers get a bad rap, but uh, here's a plug for, you know, having a lawyer on your side because they can have that conversation for you without necessarily damaging a relationship. Yeah. And they can be the difference between a good deal and a bad deal. They really yes, do. That's true. Um, yeah. Sometimes uh, people are young and they sign a contract just to be down and to go through the excitement of being down with a label. And then you find out years later, it wasn't a good deal. What was your, do you have any cool stu studio stories? Cause you hear all the stuff about like the studio, man, we used to be up, we'd be up all night and you know, smoking blunts and it was girls and it was all this, like, is the studio that fun? Or like, was like a horrible place? You, <laughs> you can tell the together. truth, I'm almost 30 dad. You I, could think you could I think it's fun for a lot of people depending on who you are. 
I remember um, one weekend I worked on Jay-Z's uh, soundtrack to uh, the Amer American Gangster. Um, they had called me up and said, Tony, are you willing to work the weekend? I, I called myself being cute. I, I, I didn't tell them right away. Of course I was going to do it, but I didn't <laughs> right away. Their people came in the studio and scoped it out and all that Friday evening. The session I had with them was uh, Saturday. So when I got there Saturday, they had the conference room laid out with all kind of fruit, cheese, wine, beer, cigars, all kind of stuff. And I'm like, wow. So Beyonce and Jay-Z end up coming up. And I'm like, this is how multi-millionaires do it and, and all. And I'm like, wow. I had never seen nothing like that. I mean, when you work with me, we would feed you. You were able to order food from various restaurants and all that. But I had never seen nothing on that level. I mean, they, they had a $200 bottle of wine, which I got to sample wow. some of later oh. in the night, you know? And um, I remember Beyonce being wow. there. She was about- You met Beyonce? Stop. Sorry. She was, she was uh, at the <laughs> table. She was looking at her um, stuff for Revlon. She had all these magazines laid out and that woman was about her business. Period. And I didn't even, I didn't even bother her introduce her because she looked like she was on a, 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 another level. Later on, she came into my studio and I had a picture of Kendra there, and she said she's adorable. So what this I this is did, a picture of me when I was like two years old. I was. Uh, you're adorable. Old. You still are, but you're adorable. <laughs> so since Kendra looks like me, I got on the phone yeah. with my sisters the next day, and I said Beyonce said I was adorable. Period. Yeah, well, I, I said, well, I look like Kendra, right? She looks like me, so I, I ran with that. I had a little fun with that, but uh, is there any new artist that you would love the opportunity to work with? Ooh, oh, I love to work with Meg Megan Thee Stallion. She's still okay. yes. I, I love yeah. her. I Same. love her music. Oh, I, would, yeah. I would, I would almost do a session with her for free. You know, Period. I just I love her talent and her vibe. So you're so you're you're uh, saying that you're a hot, a hot like a part of the hot girl gang. You're you're he's a hot you're boy, pro, hot girl summer. You're like <laughs> I I think I'm a little too old to be chasing these young girls. But in a musical sense, I would love to get with them. In the musical sense, I would love to get with them. No doubt. <laughs> I love it. Your dad's so cool, Kendra. Oh, thank, oh, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. I've always kept it professional. Um, I've had many attractive, beautiful women in my studio, but they're not there for nothing. I, so. I wasn't trying to imply that you were going to like try to get with Megan. I just, are, are you part of the hot girl army? Like, do you support Megan? You know, like, like, are you like on Megan's side or Tory oh, Lane? Period. Period. <laughs> are you who? Team, the, team Megan or team Tory? Oh, I definitely say uh, Megan for sure. Period. Okay. All right, period. that's all we need to know. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I just think it's so cool because I feel like so many people like stop listening to new music after a certain point in life. The fact that like you just you stay current. I'm I, I struggle like uh, yes yeah, with some of it because I I'm, I don't like it. Like the I thing like is working in a studio too. We used to get something called Billboard magazine. Mm, so you yeah. look at the charts, you see what's top or what's popping. And sometimes you went out and bought the music because of that. Um, I don't have a subscription to Billboard anymore, but I do miss those days because you you were probably more informed. Now with the internet, of course, I could be more informed, but it's just so much music up there. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to tell you I spend a lot of time searching and all and looking for stuff. I uh, vibe off of what I hear on the radio, you know, different yeah. radio stations. I could I could send you a playlist. Do you have Spotify, Dad? Which Spotify does have awful, uh, you know, they don't pay the artists that they stream that much, which is why you should always buy stuff from the artist. What I usually do is like, I have a few friends who are in bands. I buy their album, but I don't really have a CD player. So I'll listen to it on Spotify, but you buy yeah. the album. Yeah, that's the problem. A lot of those streamings, they are not yeah, they're paying awful. the artists. And I'm, Spotify I'm needs to pay people more. All of them, Spotify, Tidal, I heard, does a little bit better, but yeah. most of them are not paying people. I hear so many producers that I work with saying that their royalty checks have gotten to be almost nothing compared to what mm -hmm. they were 20, 30 yeah. years ago. And I, it, it hurts my heart. You know, I'm from an era where people brought music. They supported their artists. If you love the Jill Scott fans, since you went and brought her album, that's yeah. simple. And you enjoyed it. They made money, the record company made money and all. And nowadays, all these streaming sites, 
I, I barely do the streaming thing because I'm just so much against it, you know, mm. I'm not paying the artists like they should. I think it's, mm. I think it's so foul, yeah. but it's the way it is. It's the current issue. I'll still buy CDs now. They're harder to get, but I'll still get my hands on a CD. Mm-hmm. Like I need yeah. to go buy the new Nas, the Nas album, which won a Grammy. I had, um, he won the, the Grammy now for best rap album. I had two albums up there that I was up for another Grammy with, um, Royce the Five Nine. Mm-hmm. as well as Jay Electronica. They didn't win, but but mm-hmm. Nas did. So I was happy for him. Yeah. I mastered the first Nas album, the Illmatic, which is the best one. And um, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I, I got to go support him. I got to go buy his album and all. Yeah, you know? yeah. And yeah. Th- just thank you so much okay. for joining us. I, 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 I feel like this conversation going forever, but I will be respectful of your time, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, it was so nice to hear everything that you have to say because... I think that, um, first of all, to, to hear from someone who's firsthand connected to all these major artists that we all listen to every day is amazing. And I don't think that we all appreciate like all the steps that go mm-hmm. into what it takes to get that final product. So I think that's extraordinary also to have like an insight into that. I do think that it was so good to hear because in this podcast, like we look at like, how is it when you're not white and you are a different race or a different culture? How does that work with your profession? And I thought it was really nice to hear that you thought that it, it didn't hurt you. And in any, you know, and if in some ways it could help you. It's a shame that there's not as many black people in the mastering business, but it was nice to hear that there was one area that someone could work and you were in it and you didn't say that it was difficult for you so well thank you that I was thank nice. you for having me nice I appreciate your time uh, th- thank you for watching Not Another, or listening to Not Another White Man's podcast. We are available wherever podcasts are found. That includes YouTube, Spotify, uh, Amazon, and Apple Music. And we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>